When Pete Hallett ran for mayor in um, 1989, Lynn Spizzito, the Sherry's daughter, was in town and she was intently having this case investigated. She had, she had a news conference and she said, a vote for Pete Hallett is not a vote for my mother. And we were all baffled and as journalists going nuts, trying to understand what did she mean? What is she talking about? And she wouldn't say, she wouldn't tell us the rest of the story. Uh, she couldn't. After the election, Pete had just been elected. Lynn called a television reporter Ed Bryson, and um, he had an interview with Bobby Joe Fabian, and it blew the lid off the Sherry case for the public. In Sunday's interview, inmate Bobby Fabian said, Hallett, Nick. Everyone was astounded that this murder had been tracked to Louisiana State Prison. Mayor Hallett said he would submit to a lie detector test if investigators requested one. Everybody was just working to try to find answers and to do what needed to be done to, to find out what happened to the Sherry's. Hallett calls the allegations an outright lie. Outright lie. I'm Jed Lipinski. This is Gone South. Episode 6, Pig Trail. Bobby Joe Fabian's story was rebroadcast by news outlets across the Southeast. The notion that the sitting mayor of Biloxi, the victim's best friend, The man who delivered the eulogy at their funeral, who was behind the murders, was almost too much to comprehend. The news divided Biloxi, which was weary from decades of political scandals. Former Mayor Gerald Blessy had only recently been ruled out as a suspect in the two-year investigation into the Sherry slayings, and now his successor was being accused of playing a lead role. In the frenzy surrounding Pete's potential complicity, it was possible to overlook the fact that Bobby Joe Fabian had also named the trigger man, John Ransom. Tell me how the murder was arranged. Peter Hurlett and them agreed to have him killed. They got John Ransom to kill him, you see, out of Atlanta. Me and Curtis and Nick's been dealing with John Ransom for a long time on several things, you know and all that, and uh, he was called up, asked if he wanted to take it, you know, and uh, he took it. You know, he received uh, $25,000 worth of crank, 10,000 in cash. Overnight pay? Yeah, he was, it was overnight express, you know. The rest is history. The rest is history. I remember that John Ransom's name came up in my conversations with Bobby Joe Fabian and and perhaps with others who I was talking to about the case. You know, the thing to remember about John Ransom is he is this, uh, you know, to coin a phrase maybe, this peg-legged hitman, so to speak, is the way that uh, I think Bobby Joe Fabian or others were describing him to me. This was the first anyone had heard of John Ransom in relation to the Sherry homicides. But Ransom was well known to law enforcement. A rail-thin, 62-year-old man from Smyrna, Georgia, whose right leg had been blown off by a shotgun during a bar brawl, Ransom had a prolific rap sheet that stretched back to the 1940s. Police had identified him as a prominent member of the Dixie Mafia and an associate of Kirksey Nix. That wasn't all. A month before Bobby's interview with Ed Bryson, Ransom had been charged in the murder of a truck driver and was being held in Georgia's Coweta County Jail. The autopsy report showed the man had been shot five times in the head with a 22 caliber pistol, the same caliber used in the Sherry hit. From the looks of it, Ransom appeared to fit the profile of the professional hitman police believed killed the Sherrys that September night in 1987. This detail lent Bobby's story an air of credibility. But the morning after the interview aired, Pete Hallett called the veracity of Bobby Joe's entire story into question. Let me once again state that any suggestion 
that I was involved in planning the murder of Vincent Margaret Sherry is an outright lie. At a press conference in Biloxi, Pete vehemently refuted Bobby's allegations and accused the press of falling for the lies of a self-avowed con man and twice convicted murderer. I guess it's because I'm now the mayor of the city of Bluxy. It seems that the mayor, you know, gets into the hot seat. Anybody who occupies the mayor seat, mayor seat Bluxy automatically becomes a suspect in anything that goes. Listening to your press conference around that time, you're outraged. I was pissed off, big time. I mean, I I knew that I hadn't done that, and um, and obviously I was I was I was appalled that they they said that it was because of stolen scam money that I'd blamed on Vincent, Vincent Sherry, who was probably one of two or three of my best friends in the whole world at that time, you know? Pete not only denied that he or Vince had stolen half a million dollars of Kirksey Nix's scam proceeds, he denied knowing anything about any scam money whatsoever. The very suggestion of it still angers Pete 33 years later. I never, ever talked to Kirksey Nix about missing scam money. I never, ever talked to any living person about missing scam money. So I don't know how, how, how much clearer I can say that it, it, this whole thing that's based on missing scam money is an, is an outright lie. It's a canard. It's a pig trail. It, it just, it never happened. There never was missing scam money that was stolen. Never, ever happened. I don't know how I can make that any clearer to you. In his televised statement, Bobby Joe said he suspected Pete had stolen the scam money and then blamed Vince to cover up the theft. Pete found this idea absurd. If I stole the money and blamed it on Vince, and they now know that Vince really didn't steal the money, I stole the money, why in the fuck am I still walking around here without being dead? Do you think, do you think Kirksey Nix is stupid? If I stole the money and blamed it on Vince, and they all know that, why am I not dead? Why, why did they kill Vince and not me if I stole the money? It doesn't make a damn bit of sense. In the flurry of accusations, Pete latched onto one that could be easily disproved. The idea that he met with Bobby Joe and Kirksey Nix at Angola to plan the murders. Soon after learning of Bobby's allegations, Pete called his new chief of detectives, Kevin Ladner. A former narcotics investigator, Ladner had been appointed to the post just a few weeks earlier only to see his new boss implicated in a murder conspiracy. After he became mayor and I take over the Office of Investigations, the uh, Angola accusation started, and, it, and from that point on, it was like, here we go. <laughs> it's going to be a long four years. you got a, a sitting mayor being investigated. Over the phone, Pete ordered Ladner to drive to Angola and pull copies of the visitation logs, then fax them back to him in time for another press conference that Pete planned to hold in Jackson the following day. And my instructions were to go to Angola to retrieve the uh, sign-in logs to show that he was not there when it was alleged to be there, and he wanted me to fax those documents back to him immediately so he could have them in hand when he had his press conference to prove that he wasn't there. It was a matter of the boss said, do, you do. (laughs) During the press conference in Jackson, where WLBT is based, Pete declared that the visitation logs at Angola clearly showed that he had not visited the prison in March of 1987 the month Bobby said the meeting took place. He accused the news station of irresponsible journalism and threatened to sue them unless a retraction was issued. Had they contacted the Warren's office, they would have found out that no such meeting between three convicts and me had ever taken place and that the obviously motivated allegations of Bobby Fabian were indeed nothing more 
than an outright lie. I wasn't in Angola on March the 17th, and I really, I really couldn't believe that, that they had put that on television without at least doing a cursory investigation. I mean, the, the administration office was like 200 yards from the main gate that you go into Angola. And all they had to do, you know, was, was, was go there and check it out, and they would have seen that, that there wasn't no such meeting that had occurred. Talking with me in 2022, Pete said he couldn't speak to Bobby's motives for implicating him in the Sherry murder conspiracy. But he suspected it was out of revenge. As Pete told it, Kirksey Nix had referred Bobby to him at some point in the mid-1980s. Bobby was serving life without parole at Angola, and he was looking for a way out. Yeah, he, he was a dreamer. Okay, what he wanted me to do was to find out if he got transferred to Mississippi, if he would have a chance at parole. So I said, all right, well, send me, send me a little retainer, send me $250, and I'll see what I can do. So he sends me $250. I had a friend of mine who um, I knew out of law school who worked for the state counseling the uh, probation and parole board. I asked him to make some inquiries to see if Bobby Joe Fabian got transferred to Mississippi that he would have a chance to make parole. He called me up, man, he said, this guy's too hot. There's no way they're going to do anything uh, for this. He said, there's a better chance of naming Capitol Street after a general that burned down Georgia before this guy gets parole out of Mississippi. Soon after that, Pete delivered the bad news to Bobby by phone. And I said, uh, Bobby Joe, uh, I don't think we're going to have any luck in uh, Mississippi. And I said, I've talked to these people and blah, blah, this. And he said, all right, well, just send my money back. And I said, what do you mean send your money back? I, I spent about 15, 20 hours on your case, you know, and all you gave me was $250. He said, you better send me my money back. I said, I'll see you later, bud. Hung the phone up, done with him. Pete told his secretary to close Bobby Joe's file and return it to him. He forgot all about Bobby Joe until Ed Bryson walked into his office a year later, saying Bobby had accused him of planning Vince and Margaret's murders. How well known is that story, your backstory with Bobby Joe? Not, not very well known because no, none of the media would bother to, uh, uh, to publish it. I mentioned it 15 or 20 times. Speaking to the press corps, Pete then turned to his association with Kirksey Nix. Pete had terminated their attorney-client relationship in May of 1988, he explained, shortly after FBI agent Royce Hignight informed him that Kirksey was under investigation for running a fraud and scam ring out of Angola. Pete said he'd known nothing about the scam. When Hignight asked the firm to provide copies of Kirksey's financial records, Pete promptly complied. Pete admitted to visiting Kirksey in prison on at least two occasions during their nine-year relationship. Angola Records would confirm when those visits took place, he said. But he insisted that, on no visit did I or Nix ever discuss any illegal activity. Bobby Joe had first told his story to the Sherry family's private investigator Rex Armistead in the early spring of 1989. It wasn't until five months later that his story aired on TV. It's unclear if Pete Hallett knew that Bobby was cooperating with authorities during that time. But Pete was well aware that the Sherry family's opinion of him had changed dramatically. In late April of 1989, in the heat of Hallett's mayoral campaign, Lynn Spazito had driven to Biloxi and called an impromptu press conference. Contrary to the beliefs of many, she told the Sun-Herald, a vote for Pete Hallett is not a vote for Margaret Sherry. When asked why she felt this way, Lynn was evasive. The real reason, of course, was that Bobby Joe Fabian had told her private eye that Pete was the catalyst behind her parents' murders. When Lynn told me what Bobby Joe Fabian had revealed to Rex and how that implicated Pete Hallett in this entire conspiracy that ended in murder, as you can imagine, a lot of emotions go through from not wanting to believe it 
to accepting that this really could be true, then you just kind of feel nauseous. Surely that can't be right. This guy's our friend. This is Leslie Miller again. By the spring of 89, Leslie was back at college, but she still returned to Biloxi on weekends and holidays and occasionally bumped into Pete at events. Lynn warned her to keep her distance. I mean, he was my dad's law partner for years and a good friend of the family. So she did feel the need to let me know, hey, this isn't public knowledge, but you need to know it looks like Pete's involved and here's how it all lays out. Leslie and her siblings questioned Bobby's credibility. But the Sherrys did trust Rex Armistead, and he too suspected Pete was involved. So they decided to believe Bobby Joe's story. Leslie says she felt a profound sense of betrayal. Once it was laid out for us by someone who was in Angola and privy to this information, it was kind of hard not to go back and second guess all those interactions. You know, he... Him, him coming to the house, him reading the eulogy, him standing up there like he was as heartbroken as the rest of us. You just kind of get that sense of betrayal mixed with disgust. Lynn and Leslie had initially been encouraged by Pete's run for mayor, imagining he would help resuscitate their parents' murder investigation. In light of Bobby's statement, however, they now saw darker motives. Perhaps Pete wanted to be mayor to control the investigation and make sure it pointed away from him. You know, the police came to see me and talked to me when it happened. And, you know, it was strange because when I came back from that interview, I told a friend of mine, I said, well, this is one thing they can't accuse me of doing. As Bobby Joe's partner in the scam, Kirksey Nix had watched as Bobby amassed hundreds of thousands of dollars by tricking gay men into thinking he wanted a relationship with them. And yet, Kirksey claims he was shocked that anyone bought Bobby's story about the missing scam money. But I, I didn't think anybody would believe him, truthfully. I was uh, upset, but what can I do? He's already made the allegation, you know, and I just didn't think they'd believe it. In emails and phone calls, Kirksey freely admitted participating in the scam, but he denied playing any part in the murders. It's a stance he has always maintained. Like Pete, he attacked the essential premise of Bobby's statement, claiming his scam money had never gone missing in the first place. Peter Hallett, the Sherry firm, and Judge Sherry never took any of my money. I never thought they took any of my money. And... You know, and let's keep it real. If if I thought somebody got my money, I have ways of finding out which one it was. You know, you know what I'm saying? Kirksey noted that even if Vince had stolen his money, he wouldn't have killed him over it. And had Judge Sherry owed me the kind of money that they were talking about and somebody shot him, I'd have probably jumped in front of him and, and hoped they shot low. I didn't uh-huh. have any missing money, but it doesn't make any sense if, if you kill a guy that owes you money, how do you get your money back? Right. Moreover, he questioned the financial logic of paying a man $35,000 to kill another man who owed him $500,000. Yeah, and, and, and on top of that, you know, I make a living making people chase money in the scams. just like the carnival wrestle. So I, I'm really reluctant to chase them bad money with good money that's already lost. (laughs) You you know what I'm saying? Kirksey and Bobby Joe had known each other well before their paths crossed at Angola. They met for the first time in Tulsa in the 1960s. At the time, he was doing uh, what they called chugging grocery stores on the check cashing day. Bobby would jump over that cage and get the check cashing drawer. You know, and this was in the six, early 60s. And you might get 2500 or 3000 or something like that. But that was money back then. And Bobby was the guy that was kind of always broke and always willing to work. 
The two reunited at Angola in the late 70s and eventually began working together on the homosexual scam. But that wasn't the only scam Bobby was involved in. In the late 80s, according to Kirksey, Bobby was attempting to scam his way out of Angola and into Mississippi State Prison by impersonating public officials. He was calling the Louisiana Pardon Board like he was from the Mississippi Pardon Board and saying that they'd like to have him serve some of his time that he owed them for the Lennox murders. They all thought they were talking to their equivalents in the Department of Corrections, the Pardon Boards, and the Governor's Office, and they were all talking to him. Kirksey claims Bobby was on the verge of getting transferred. But his efforts were sabotaged when yet another scam he was running, this one involving forged Blue Cross checks, exploded after the FBI busted his outside contact at a Western Union. The woman goes in there and tries to cash the two checks and they arrest her. And she told him about the pardon scam. And that all blows up. Kirksey said Bobby's pardon scam collapsed sometime in the fall of 1988. Around that time, Bobby was also having trouble with a well-known Angola drug dealer. He owed a, a serious drug man in Angola about three or $4,000 and evidently couldn't pay it. So when Rex Armistead materialized at Angola a few months later, Kirksey said, Bobby spied a new opportunity to get transferred out of Angola. And that's when he came up with the missing money deal and his next step. That's when it started. After speaking with Rex, Kirksey says, Bobby began gathering previously unpublished information about the Sherry case. You know, he talks to somebody in the family, he talks to the newspaper, he talks to the TV station, then he talks to a policeman, then he talks to, to the district attorney, and by the time he does all that, he's picked up enough information to sound credible. People that know him, the officers in Angola, and of course the, the convicts, they know he's totally non-credible, but he is, a, he is an excellent, intuitive con man. For Kirksey, Bobby's statement was nothing more than an expertly crafted con job perpetrated on law enforcement and the general public. He's thinking four steps ahead of you at all times, and he can do that to a lawyer, he can do it to a college professor, he can do it to a security officer, he's done it before. I definitely learned from him, and I'm, and I'm no slouch. Authorities had gone nearly two years without developing a single viable suspect, Kirksey pointed out. People wanted answers. They wanted closure. And Bobby, like any good con man, simply exploited their desires. It's easy to make someone believe what they wish was true. It's an element of human nature, and con men rely on human nature. Now, I think it's a Mark Twain quote, a lie will go around the world while the truth is pulling its boots on. We got a briefing, I believe Tommy Moffat, who was the chief at the time, uh, briefed myself and Joe Price. And uh, I can still remember saying to myself, boy, I'm glad I'm not in charge of this thing. This is going to be a tough one to work. This is Randy Cook, a former captain for the Harrison County Sheriff's Office. I just knew from the start, this is obviously a professional hit on a judge and his wife. Those are tough things to uh, investigate and solve. And I, I just, it was just my inner thoughts that I, I'm glad I'm not in charge of this and I'm, I'm glad somebody else is having to carry this load. A year after the murders, Randy wanted a change of pace. He left the sheriff's office and took a job with a local cruise line. I was contacted by an attorney for the cruise line saying they were looking for a chief of security and wanted to know if I would be interested. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And I went and interviewed and got hired. This was probably in early 89. And I, it didn't take long to realize I'd, I'd made a mistake. That just, it just wasn't what I wanted to do in life. On June 1st, 1989, two months before Bobby's TV interview aired, Randy Cook rejoined the sheriff's department. 
So I showed up the next morning at the sheriff's office, and uh, within a day or two, I met with both Farley and Joe, and they established what I would be doing and in, in my rank. I came back as a captain, and basically uh, I was going to be the sheriff's assistant. The next day, Joe Price handed him the transcript of an interview that he, Rex Armistead, and Biloxi's city attorney had done with Bobby Joe a month earlier. I told Joe, I said, uh, if you'd like, I'll, I'll be glad to look at that interview and, and read it. And if you want me to, I'll, I'll take up uh, the slack and start looking at it. And he handed me the case and said, here you, here you go. This was in early June of 89. So I started uh, reading the interview with Bobby Joe Fabian. Randy was a well-respected investigator. His return to the sheriff's office was the equivalent of a team's star pitcher coming out of retirement, not knowing that his coach intended for him to pitch in the World Series. But Randy gladly accepted the challenge. His interview with Bobby was intended to clarify elements of his earlier account. But Randy came away from the meeting unsettled by some discrepancies. In the first interview, Bobby had said Pete's involvement was limited to blaming Vince for stealing the scam money. In the second interview, however, Bobby cast Pete in a more menacing light. He said Pete had spoken to John Ransom on the phone, describing the layout of the Sherry's house and the best time to go. He also said Pete saw a chance to eliminate a political rival in Margaret by, as he put it, killing two birds with one stone. But Randy saw glimmers of honesty in Bobby's account. For example, Bobby claimed Lorray Sharp was knee-deep in the scam and that Pete had lied to get her access to Angola's private attorney-client rooms, where she exchanged scam documents with Kirksey. Bobby also noted that on the day the murders were allegedly planned, Lorray had patched the call from Angola to John Ransom, then stayed on the line while payment was discussed. Randy recognized Lorray's name from the Sherry case file. He knew she had worked out of the Hallett Sherry office, where she claimed to have helped Kirksey with his pardon bid. But that didn't quite explain the hundreds of phone calls with Angola over a nine-month period. Bobby's mention of John Ransom also rang true. A quick background check revealed a string of past arrests for robbery, extortion, and weapons violations. And while he lacked any murder convictions, police believed Ransom was a hitman for the Dixie Mafia. Once he explained the mechanics of the scam and what the scam was all about, that would explain Nix's ability to purchase a car, purchase a house, all the phone calls going and coming to Pete Hallett's office and Lorraine Sharp being in Pete Hallett's office. That pretty well explained that aspect to me. And then the fact that he named this hitman who had the reputation of being a hitman. So those pieces started coming together. After the interview, Randy called the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to request photographs and arrest records for John Ransom. Then he drove to Ocean Springs, Mississippi, to speak with LaRae Sharp. And uh, I, I really didn't know what she looked like, didn't know what to expect. And um, she answered the door and had this uh, bright blonde hair and made up extremely well. Lorraine was reluctant to talk to Randy, but she ultimately agreed to sit down with him. In the interview, she confessed to playing a limited role in the scam between August and December of 1985, but no further. She denied any involvement in the murders. Uh, we brought her into Slidell and interviewed her at length to get a taste of what she had to say, which ended up being nothing. Uh, she just... You know, I, I don't know anything about anything. I'm just a paralegal trying to get a guy out of prison. But Randy felt that Lorray knew more than she let on. Phone records he later obtained from her attorney showed that her calls with Kirksey at Angola extended well into 1986. They also revealed three-way calls between Angola and John Ransom. Lorray Sharp was obviously the feet on the ground or the boots on the ground for this 
scam operation and, and uh, she was handling the money for Nix and supposedly Fabian. She was working inside of Pete Hallett's office. So she, at least in my opinion, was kind of a key player in this. Over the next few weeks, Randy and the sheriff's office, with help from DA investigators, strove to corroborate Bobby Joe's story. By now, Pete Hallett had been elected mayor of Biloxi, and they took pains to conceal Bobby's allegations from the Biloxi PD, fearful that they would leak the information to their new boss. Then, in late July, Randy received an unexpected phone call. Our district attorney's office gets a call from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation that John Ransom had been arrested and so contacted uh, the GBI and they explained that John Ransom had been arrested in Noonan, Georgia for a murder where he had shot someone in the head with a small caliber pistol. Randy was stunned. Nearly two years had passed before John Ransom was mentioned in connection to the Sherry case. And now, just months after Bobby dropped his name, Ransom had been charged in a murder that was eerily similar to the Sherry homicides. Randy and a DA investigator immediately flew to Smyrna, Georgia, where they procured a warrant to search Ransom's house. His living situation in a leafy middle-class suburb of Atlanta was not what Randy expected of a reputed Dixie Mafia hitman. There were two sides to John Ransom. There was the Dixie Mafia hitman guy, and there was John Ransom, the family man. He had a nice home. He had a pretty nice family, a working family. They kept family and crime in two different arenas. A thorough search of the house failed to produce the murder weapon. As they were wrapping up, however, the DA investigator crawled under the house and made a startling discovery. And in that search, a GBI agent found in the crawl space up on a joist, a 22 silencer. It was in very good condition. It was wrapped in a rag as if to preserve it. And it was, it was uh, just like it had been made recently. Investigators had determined that the hitman who killed the Sherrys had used a homemade silencer, a foam rubber contraption that attached to a gun barrel. This accounted for the strange bits of foam rubber present at the crime scene. The silencer recovered from Ransom's house did not match the homemade silencer used in the Sherry hit, but it suggested Ransom was not above using one. The house search turned up other valuable pieces of evidence. In a file folder, Randy discovered a letter from a local district attorney describing Ransom's uncanny ability to be near or present in situations where people, including potential witnesses, end up dead. He also found a notebook in which Lorray Sharp's name and phone number appeared. To Randy, this was further proof that Bobby's story held water. The next day, Randy traveled to Coweta County Jail to speak with John Ransom. I introduced myself to him, and I, I, I was expecting to see some cold-blooded killer. And instead, I see this tall, thin, bone-thin, gray-headed, grandpa-looking guy. And he was very cordial, very <laughs> friendly almost. And, uh, I mean, I didn't spook him. He, this guy, you know, go back all his years in prison and what all he'd done. And here, a little old investigator out of a sheriff's office in Mississippi threatening to arrest him. He, he wasn't worried about me a bit. But he was friendly about it. He wasn't trying to, you know. So I concluded uh, my little talk, which wasn't more than 10 minutes with him. And uh, I'd contacted Joe Price that afternoon to let him know what had transpired. Until now, the sheriff's office had succeeded in keeping Bobby Joe Fabian's cooperation a secret. But around the time Randy visited Georgia, the information leaked. A front page headline in the Sun-Herald declared, Police have answers in Sherry case. 
noting that an unnamed Louisiana inmate had identified John Ransom as the hitman. Randy was frustrated by the leak. For one thing, it placed Bobby Joe in grave danger of revenge for ratting out his accomplices. Those accomplices were now more likely to cover their tracks, knowing Bobby was cooperating with authorities. Then, two days after the article ran, Randy got a phone call from Joe Price. To his amazement, Joe explained that Bobby was about to appear on TV. And he said, well, he said, all hell is breaking loose here because Bobby Joe Fabian gave an interview at 5 o'clock and uh, <laughs> and he's basically going to say what he had told myself and Joe. It was like, well, what is he up to? Why is he doing this? And, I mean, we couldn't explain it away. Didn't know why he was doing that. Not on that day we did Randy would later learn why Bobby decided to make his story public. Fearing for his life after the newspaper leak, he had contacted Lynn Spazito. Lynn, equally afraid Bobby would be killed before he could testify, had contacted Ed Bryson. By appearing on TV, Lynn figured, Bobby's statement would be preserved. Randy tuned in for the news segment. To his relief, Bobby's story didn't differ greatly from his earlier statements. But Randy was surprised when, at a press conference the next day, Pete claimed that he wasn't present for the Angola meeting. No such meeting between three convicts and me had ever taken place. Pete had spoken with Angola, he said, and they had no record of this alleged meeting. This, of course, stood at odds with Bobby's central claim, that Pete was there when the agreement was made. Was, was Pete Alette there? Yeah. And you're sure of that? I'm positive of it. So, the following day, Randy drove to Angola to inspect the visitation logs himself. And I found, uh, you know, there's all kinds of log books kept in Angola. There's a gate log. There's a attorney visit log. There's a visit visit log. And if you don't know exactly what to ask for, you, you won't get uh, what you're looking for. Randy was familiar with Angola's sordid reputation, and he questioned the accuracy of the visitation logs. In Angola, because of their record keeping and probably uh, even some of the corruption that was taking place at the time, I don't believe at any time during this thing that the records that we had were 100% accurate or 100% complete for that matter. Just because a visit wasn't logged doesn't mean that it didn't happen because of either poor record keeping, poor employee actions, or somebody made the record disappear. As Pete had attested, the logbooks showed no evidence that he'd visited the prison in March but they did show something else that caught Randy's eye. I eventually ended up with some attorney logs that involved Pete Ouellette. And on one particular one, Pete Ouellette was trying to get into Angola to meet with Nix. Flipping back to 1986, Randy had noticed that Pete visited Kirksey on December 8th, 1986. What drew his attention was a notation in the log noting that Pete was accompanied by Mike Gillich, Biloxi's strip club king, who Keith Bell described as the banker for the Dixie Mafia. Apparently, Pete had identified Gillich as a private investigator in an effort to get him into the private attorney client room. And he was bringing his private investigator, Mike Gillich. And... Everybody by then knew Mike Gillich. He's no P.I., he's a, he's a thug. Why would Pete be bringing him in to meet with Kirksey Nix? Uh, Neil say that that didn't happen because Angola denied that visit because they, uh, they had handwritten that Gillich was not a professional investigator. Instead, the log suggested Pete had met with Kirksey alone from 12.15 p.m. to 1.42 p.m. Randy was baffled by the notation. This was the first time he'd seen Mike Gillich's name in the investigation. It prompted a dozen questions. Why had Pete driven to Angola with Mike Gillich? 
Why did he want him present for a meeting with Kirksey Nix? More important, perhaps, what did Kirksey and Pete discuss for an hour and 25 minutes, just months before Bobby Joe claimed they'd helped orchestrate the murders of Vince and Margaret Sherry? Randy didn't have the answers, but he assumed he was headed in the right direction. Less than a week after Bobby's TV appearance, George Phillips, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Mississippi, announced that his office and the FBI were taking a lead role in the investigation. Phillips' first assistant, Kent McDaniel, remembers the moment. You, you got to understand, Bobby Joe uh, was a, a perpetual snitch. Whatever he could tell to get himself out of trouble. So we all looked askance at his version of things. But that really launched us into finding out, is there any truth to what he's saying? Because he would snitch folks out for a sandwich or a candy bar or whatever. His information, although flawed, as many jailhouse snitches are, was not fatally flawed. And so George Phillips, the U.S. attorney, said, Guys, we've got to do something. Isn't there a federal hook somewhere in this? And that's when we turn to look at the scam. Until now, the feds had stayed on the fringes of the Sherry murder investigation, on the grounds that murder is not a federal crime. What Bobby offered, however, was evidence that the murder and the scam were connected. Because it was interstate, ripping off folks, not only interstate, but internationally, for money in a homosexual scam. But that's what finally, one of the things that Bobby Joe Fabian gave us was the scam. And that gave us the what we call down at the office a federal hook. There was a federal crime, interstate transportation in aid of racketeering. Special Agent Keith Bell was named lead case agent for the FBI's role in the investigation. Having lingered on the sidelines of the Sherry case for close to two years, Keith now had free reign to build a case of his own. After I was named the uh, FBI case agent on the Sherry investigation, we started the federal grand jury witnesses coming in almost immediately. Most of those early witnesses were Angola inmates. Keith suspected they had nothing new to share and were simply looking for a break on their sentences. But one early witness had no connection to the prison or the scam. His name was Chuck Legere. A former law associate of Pete Hallett's, Chuck had accompanied Pete to the Sherry home the day the bodies were discovered. Chuck had watched Bobby Joe's interview on WLBT, and he was terrified when John Ransom's photograph appeared on the screen. As he later told reporter Ed Bryson, Chuck claimed to have seen a man who closely resembled Ransom outside the Hallett Sherry law firm not long before the murders occurred. John Ransom, I saw come walking across the median of the, the clinic back there. And he stopped me, wouldn't let me go by him, and asked me the whereabouts of Vince Sherry or something to that effect. But that wasn't all Chuck had to share. In an interview with Keith Bell, he explained that Pete had been acting unusual on the day the bodies were found. According to Chuck Legere, on the way out to the residence, Pete Hallett was very, very nervous. He was tapping his fingers or knuckles on the steering wheel, appeared uh, very uh, upset to, to some extent. Once they arrived at the house, Chuck said, Pete's suspicious behavior continued. According to Chuck Legere, Pete Hallett checks the door and it's ajar, it's not locked. And Pete goes in briefly, comes right back out in just a very few seconds, and says that Vince and Margaret are dead. Judge Sherry's body was basically in the front of the house, and Margaret's body was in a far back corner bedroom way down a long hallway. So there's no way, in Chuck Legere's opinion, that Pete would have been able to know that Margaret's body was way in a back corner bedroom. Uh, it indicated perhaps prior knowledge of what had happened. The prosecutor said last week the indictment is by no means the conclusion of the Sherry murder investigation. That's what happened. Now it's up to the prosecutor and the court. 
I think Bobby Fabian is an outrageous liar on a scam for his freedom. Kirk said Nick was a walking criminal conspiracy. I have never thought Peter Lett had anything to do with this conspiracy. We sent out more subpoenas than an Idaho snowstorm. Biloxi politics, it's not the oldest profession, but the results are the same. We had no idea where it was going to go. But the one thing he was adamant about is he did not kill the Sherrys. Thank you for listening to Gone South, a creation and production of C-13 Originals, a Cadence 13 studio. Executive produced by Chris Corcoran, Chief Content Officer and Founding Partner of Cadence 13, along with Jed Lipinski, Tom Lipinski, and Ken Lee. Written and narrated by me, Jed Lipinski. Directed and produced by Lloyd Lockridge. Produced by Tom Lipinski. Edited by Alistair Sherman. Mixed and mastered by Chris Basil. Production support by Ian Mont, Margot Gray, Bill Schultz, Bob Tabador, and Sean Cherry. Original music written and performed by Casey Wayne McAllister. Artwork by Kurt Courtenay. Marketing, PR, sales, and operations and business affairs by Maura Curran, Josefina Francis, Hilary Schuff, Lauren Vieira, Lucas Santroen, Lizzie Roberti, Danny Kutrick, and Karen Andrews. Cadence 13 is an Odyssey company.